And now, we're pleased to bring you our feature presentation. My father was fond of saying, In life, we're not always afforded the luxury of being fully prepared for the obstacles we face. Confronting the unknown, he said, is how we grow. As a child, I never understood what that meant, but after many years, I've come to realize my father was right. It's only natural that we should hesitate before stepping into something unfamiliar, but to allow ourselves to be ruled by fear is to never experience anything worthwhile. Today I stand on the precipice of a challenge unlike any I faced before. Though it may be daunting, my father would say there's no path but forward. I therefore take this first step, as so many others have before me, with my head high and my courage resolute. Begin Captain's Log, Start at 58166.2 It doesn't trouble you, Captain. Trouble me, Admiral? What's that? The state of affairs in this quadrant and our place in it. In recent years, we've been through famine, war, pestilence, and even death. But we survived. I see nothing so troubling about that. Well, not when you put it that way. But I'm talking about something a little closer to home. Knowing what you're about to head into, it's uncharted territory as much for you as it is for Starfleet. The unknown is why we're out here. All the same, you're remarkably level-headed for someone about to assume his first command particularly under the circumstances. Certainly we'll face some challenges. A crew of young and relatively inexperienced officers about to embark on their first mission together. A starship, little more than a prototype, launching within weeks of completion. But I have every confidence we will adapt. Gaius, tell me something. What made you join Starfleet in the first place? promise of doing something worthwhile, the chance to venture into the unknown. 
but most of all, I suppose, the simple prospect of being able to make a difference. And you still believe that, even after all we've been through the last few years, the wars, the conflicts, none of that changes your perspective. If anything, it underscores the importance of Starfleet's mission, to venture among the stars to make peace, not war. That's exactly what I was hoping you'd say. Admiral? There are a lot of people at Starfleet Command that feel exactly the way you do. That somewhere along the way, we, we lost our innocence. That we became so focused on survival that we forgot why we're out here in the first place. And a lot of us feel like it's time we got back to our roots and started looking at the universe with a little more optimism. But why me? Why send me to usher in this new era? It had to be someone whose idealism hadn't been tainted by years of war. Someone who wouldn't be seeking conflict at every turn. Someone who still believes in the power of diplomacy. If there is to be peace in our time, our generation will have the hardest time living in it. Precisely. Approaching shuttle, this is Utopia Planitia Yard Control. Please identify and state destination. Shuttlecraft Gebert delivering commanding officer to USS F. Scott Fitzgerald. Maintain course and follow navigation beacon 1138. And welcome to Utopia Planitia. You've never been here before, have you? No, Admiral, I have not. Then may I say, you're in for a treat. many times I see it, I never get used to this. Indeed. She's quite a sight, isn't she? In just a few short months, she'll make history as the first Federation starship to cross the quadrant in under six months. Are you certainly ready for that? Remember, guys, optimism. Acknowledged, Fitzgerald. There she is, guys. A vision of beauty is a joy forever. And she's all yours. Thornton to Fitzgerald. We're beginning our final approach. Stand by for docking. Acknowledged, Admiral. Well, Gaius, are you ready? A new chapter of your life begins now. Would you mind explaining this? It's a request for transfer. It should be fairly self-explanatory. Lieutenant, you are out of line. Then it shouldn't come as a surprise that I want to go elsewhere, should it? Lieutenant, you are a never-ending source of astonishment. 
Why, thank you. That wasn't a compliment, Lieutenant. Yes, it was. You just don't realize it. Lieutenant, I... Commander, let's not make this any harder than it has to be. I don't feel capable of serving effectively under you, and you have made it abundantly clear that you have no faith in me. Therefore, I see no reason to remain here. You are the chief of security. I'm the first officer. It goes without saying that sometimes we're going to disagree, which would be fine, except that you've never even considered my recommendations. Excuse me? You heard me. Every time I make a recommendation, you reject it. I can hardly do my job properly if you won't even consider my proposals. When have I ever? A week ago, when I wanted to recalibrate the quantum torpedo guidance sensors. With no torpedoes aboard? Simulated firing runs showed that the sensors are off by a factor of- Those are simulations! Why not just wait until we have actual ammunition to test with? Because that's not what a good security officer does. Lieutenant, Kendra, listen to me for- My decision is made, yes or no. The captain should be on board shortly. You'll have to take this up with him. I'll do that. We've gone through every injector relay in both the matter and antimatter flow systems. Wherever this problem is, it's not there. <sighs> I don't understand it. A state-of-the-art vessel, and we can't even get the warp core online. Sir, it is a new design. Maybe this was something the yard engineers thought they'd have been able to iron out by now. You're suggesting this is a design flaw. <sighs> well, if it is, then at least we're in the right place. Well, since we've tried every likely possibility, now we move on to the unlikely ones. What about the EPS flow regulators? If one of them isn't functioning properly, it might result in the kinds of pressure losses we're seeing. You wanted something unlikely. Routine diagnostics haven't shown anything wrong with them, but there is a fault somewhere, and this is as good a place as any to start looking. Get a team together and turn those flow regulators inside out. Wherever this problem is, we're going to have to roll up our sleeves to find it. In the meantime, I'll see how many other items I can cross off the to-do list. Dismissed. Aye, sir. I gather things aren't going very smoothly down here. <sighs> how could you tell? I've been trying to get the structural integrity grid online, but some of the field generators are out of alignment. Are you sure it's not just a problem with the control systems? I just went through the ODN relays myself. Everything checks out. <sighs> I'll add it to the list. It may be a couple of hours before I can spare anyone to have a look. We're pretty busy down here. Is there anything I can do to help? It's best if you just leave it to my staff and I. We'll get to it, Max, I promise. I'll see if the shipyard can lend us some of their engineers to help straighten all this out. Understood. I'll be on the bridge if you need me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Well, Gaius, what do you think? I've changed assignments before. Gone from one ship to another many times, but... It's different when it's yours, isn't it? Indeed. You're still not entirely comfortable with the way she's designed, are you? Admiral? The Fitzgerald isn't exactly what you'd always imagined your first command would be. Ah. Uh. Permission to speak freely? Of course, always. It seems to me, Admiral, to be somewhat incongruous to usher in a new and more optimistic era by building what amounts to a new class of warship. Starfleet may be refocusing on exploration, but that doesn't mean we're ignoring the lessons of the last few years. Her design harkens back to a more optimistic era, 
but you of all people should know not to judge a book by its cover. She's got as much firepower as two Sovereign-class starships, a blight of hull armor and weapons adapted from the Defiant, and no families, no children. Not until we're sure it's safe. When will that be? As soon as you tell us it is. If it helps, try not to think of her as a warship. It's not what she was meant to be. If I may ask, what then was she meant to be? The next generation. It really is remarkable. You're really from a planet over a hundred thousand light years away. One hundred and four thousand light years to be precise. Is that really so strange? Of course not. I'm just amazed that someone from such a distant part of the galaxy should have an anatomy so similar to ours. Why do you say that? I suppose you could say it defies expectations. We go out into space thinking everything we encounter will be different and unusual, but reality is full of surprises. Isn't there a myth about that eons ago some ancestral species seeded the galaxy in their own image? As a matter of fact, there is. But it's not a myth. A Federation archaeologist proved their existence about 12 years ago. If you ask me, that's what's remarkable. I suppose it is. It should only take a minute to analyze these readings. Take your time, Doctor. Doctor, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we finished calibrating the power conduits on this deck. Medical system should be stable now. Acknowledged. Thank you, Ensign. So how did you wind up in Starfleet? Being from the other side of the galaxy, I'm curious what drew your interest. Well, we don't have anything like the Federation where I come from. A few loose alliances between solar systems, but nothing on such a grand scale. I was on a deep space exploration vessel when we encountered an ion storm and were disabled. Luckily, a Federation starship answered our distress call and came to our rescue. When they explained who they were, I was intrigued and… and the rest is history. Do you miss home? Home is more than 100,000 light years away, but I'm living my dream. Getting to see parts of the galaxy that no one else from my species ever has. That's why we're all in Starfleet. Well, as far as I can tell, you're in perfect health. All your vital signs are consistent with established baseline, and as far as I can tell, the alveoli in your lungs are having no trouble processing the ship's air. You sound surprised. I've learned never to take anything for granted, especially with someone whose periodic table doesn't include xenon or helium. You are fit for duty, Ensign, but any symptoms of dizziness, nausea, difficulty breathing, report back here for blood gas infusion. Of course. Thank you, Doctor. Captain, Ensign Leslie Call, Astrophysics Officer Junior Grade, reporting for duty. As you were, Ensign. Hello, Gaius. Elizabeth, it's good to see you again. Gaius, if you'll excuse us, I believe the Ensign was about to accompany me for an inspection of the science systems. Admiral, I understand the Fitzgerald has a prototype transpectral sensor array. I'd like to have a look. Yes, Admiral. It is good to see you again. I was gratified when you accepted this posting. I hadn't seen you in almost eight years. I was starting to think we'd never see each other again. But then I never could say no to you. A fact you always exploit to your advantage. Except, of course, when it comes to... Romance is a game for the young doctor. May I? Of course, please. I assume these new facilities meet with your approval. For once, Starfleet Medical actually listened to us lowly field officers. They finally managed to design a sickbay that's fit for modern medicine, with the exception of the EMH. I doubt whether you could stand it were it too perfect. Then all is in order. Your medical records arrived from your last posting just this morning. I've already cataloged them into the medical database, so that should be that. 
and the same for the rest of the crew. All 618 are fully accounted for, including Ensign Call. Excellent. Then I won't keep you from your duties any longer, Doctor. I'll see you in 10 forward this afternoon. Gaius, there is something you should know. What's that? Some members of the crew are having a harder time getting settled than others. In what way? A few members of the senior staff seem almost to be at odds with each other. I noticed it when I first came aboard, but I thought it would have worked itself out by now. But two weeks later, it's only gotten worse. Mm. That is unfortunate. Recommendations. I'm not a counselor, but... Please, speak freely, Doctor. I've never seen a Starfleet crew behave like this before, especially not senior officers. And I have no idea how I can help solve it. Thank you, Doctor. a relic out of the 60s. So how well do you know the captain? I've actually never met him, believe it or not. The orders to report for duty came through Starfleet headquarters. Why do you ask? Nobody really seems to know that much about him. I looked at his service record, the usual commendations and endorsements from past commanding officers, but there isn't much there, is there? You check too. I was understandably curious. So what did you think? His experience seems awfully thin for someone taking command of a galaxy-class starship. I choose to believe that Starfleet knew what it was doing when it selected him for the assignment, but it's still damn peculiar. I take it you and Lieutenant Erickson still aren't getting along. She asked for a transfer earlier today. Says she thinks there's no way for us to continue to serve together. Did she say why? It doesn't matter. Ultimately, it's the captain's decision. What do you think you'll say? Probably that, in terms of first impressions, a first officer losing a security chief after only three weeks leaves much to be desired. Would he be wrong? Everyone makes mistakes. Attention to orders! To Captain Gaia Samuel Rafe, Stardate 58167. You are hereby requested and required to take command of USS F. Scott Fitzgerald as of this date. Signed, Rear Admiral Margaret Thornton, Starfleet Command. Computer, transfer all command codes to Captain Gaius Rafe, authorization Thornton Gamma 673. Command codes transferred. She's all yours, Captain. Understood. Dismissed. Captain. Welcome aboard. Thank you, Commander. I take it everything is in order. As a matter of fact, sir, there are a few minor issues that have cropped up. I've prepared a report summarizing status of ship and crew. A request for transfer. Yes, sir. Who? Lieutenant Erickson. For what reason, Commander? You should probably ask the lieutenant, sir. Very well. I'll speak with the lieutenant shortly. Very good, sir. Regarding these system status reports, it appears as though we're several days behind schedule. Captain. Merv, it's good to see you. I understand you've encountered some difficulties readying the Fitzgerald for launch. Yes, sir. I'm afraid we have. There's a problem with the EPS system that we haven't been able to track down yet. And until we get it resolved, we won't have main power or warp engines. Understood. How can I help? <sighs> We're stretched pretty thin, sir. Too many problems and too few of us. I have asked for help from the yard engineers, but... Well, the superintendents basically told me to get in line. I think I can take care of that. What else, Commander? That's the most significant issue we have, Admiral. If the shipyards can help us get the EPS system repaired, we should be able to handle the rest in flight. Very good. Prepare a support requisition detailing precisely what materials and personnel you require, and provide it to Admiral Thornton as soon as possible. Aye, sir. With your permission, I'll get started on that right now. 
Dismissed. Report to the bridge, Commander. I'll join you shortly. Aye, sir. Gaius, are you sure you can handle all this? Well, you should never, never doubt what nobody is sure of, Admiral. As I said, there will be challenges ahead. The true test lies not in avoiding those challenges, but in meeting them. Come in. You left him forward so abruptly I wasn't able to speak with you. I thought I'd save you the trouble. No sense saying hello if you're just going to say goodbye. Yes, I was told you requested a transfer. Then how soon should I be ready to disembark? You seem convinced that you have no place here. Yet our mission hasn't even begun. You've had no real opportunity to get to know the others. With all due respect, sir, yes I have. More than enough to know I don't belong here. You said much the same thing when you left the Exeter, and the Gallico before that, and the Jeffress before that. Your previous commanding officers seemed little motivated to retain you as a member of their crews. Can you speculate as to why? A failure to adhere to Starfleet protocol. Poor emotional control leading to explosive outbursts and tendencies of disrespect for authority, bordering on gross insubordination. That's what others say. But I'm more interested in what you have to say. What is it you're looking for? Captain, I appreciate what you're trying to do, but with all due respect, I've made my decision. If I was looking for something, it's clear to me I won't find it here. So there's no reason for me to stay, and every reason for me to leave. Lieutenant, request denied. I appeal to you not to turn your back on us so quickly. There are always possibilities. Sometimes all it takes is a leap of faith. I've never had that before. What's that? No one's ever made the effort to change my mind. Told me I was making the wrong choice. We all face a crisis of confidence sooner or later. None think we're ready, but we are. We simply must find the courage to accept what we already know. What? Something a boyhood mentor once said. I'll see you on the bridge, Lieutenant. We've been having problems getting the power systems calibrated. I think engineering has it resolved. We should be clear for warp speed. The navigational library is online. You should check to make sure you have access. I'll do that right now. Check with the security station on Deck 12. Their last report indicated they were still having trouble with some of the internal sensor relays. I think a team from engineering is working on that now. Double check anyway. Captain on the bridge. As you were, please. Mr. Garrett, status report. Diagnostics complete. All primary systems are functioning within normal parameters. Excellent work to all involved. A long time ago, my father told me that the difference between success and failure very often comes down to belief. To overcome obstacles, he said, you must first believe in yourself. As Starfleet officers, it's little different, only we must also believe in one another. We've only just come to know each other, and we must still learn to work together as one crew. But I have the utmost faith that each of you will offer your very best in the mission to come. And in time, we will become one of the finest crews in Starfleet. Now what do you say we get to work? Departure stations. Mr. Garrett, clear all moorings. Bridge to engineering. Merv, it's time. Start your engines. Aye, sir. Automatic moorings are retracted. Yard traffic control has cleared us for departure. Helm, plot a course out of the shipyards and prepare to engage. Aye, sir. Vectors plotted. Course laid in. Inertial dampers to flight configuration. Engineering status. 
Main power holding steady, Captain. Matter-antimatter reaction is stable, and EPS flow pressure is nominal. Lieutenant, bring the external sensors online and verify our departure vectors are clear of traffic. Yes, sir. Confirmed. All vectors clear. All decks report ready. She's all yours, sir. Thank you, Commander. Ensign call. Aft thrusters ahead one quarter, port and starboard at station keeping. Aye, sir. Thrusters ready. Thrusters ahead, Ensign. Take us in. Constant bridge. Driver coils are aligned, field generators are synchronized. Warp power at your discretion. Course heading, Captain? Set course bearing 310, mark 215. Speed warp 7. Course and speed set. Engage. is exploration of a sort. We'll conduct a three-month survey of sites of scientific interest throughout the Federation, after which we'll report to Starbase 412 for a shipwide diagnostic. A sightseeing tour. Lieutenant, we're sitting in the most advanced starship in the fleet. Shouldn't we be doing something to bolster Federation security? Against what threat, Lieutenant? All of our tactical systems are prototypes. Nothing's even been field tested yet which makes us the field test. We should be where we can do some good, not wasting time on a glorified survey mission. Those are the orders, Lieutenant. But Commander, I still think we That is enough, Lieutenant. The Fitzgerald is, as yet, an unproven vessel. But with Starfleet refocusing on exploration rather than defense, our mission represents a vital step forward. And should we be successful, I have no doubt that very shortly we will find ourselves conducting any number of missions critical to the Federation. Uh, <clears throat> so what's our first stop? You're looking at one of the greatest scientific mysteries the Federation has ever encountered. The Mar Oscura. What's so mysterious about it? Ensign. It's a dark matter nebula with the highest concentration ever discovered. There are several planets inside the cloud, but what makes this such a unique stellar phenomenon is that the high amount of dark matter severely deforms space-time within the nebula. There are discontinuities everywhere, small pockets that appear and disappear at random, where reality itself simply ceases to exist. Fascinating. I believe the word you're looking for is dangerous. Precisely. The last time a Federation starship visited the site was nearly 14 years ago. All attempts to map or explore the interior of the nebula since then have failed. So what are we supposed to do? Our orders are to assess conditions within the nebula and determine what, if anything, might have changed in the last 14 years. Starfleet wishes to understand how changes in local conditions might have affected the spatial deformations. I'm not sure I like the idea of going in there. The place sounds like a dark matter death trap. I can work with the engineering and science teams. Maybe we can come up with a way to protect ourselves. Lieutenant, I don't believe anyone asked you to do that. 
It's called taking the initiative, Commander. In some places, that's considered a desirable attribute. There is such a thing as going too far, Lieutenant. That is true, Commander. However, in this instance, I believe it prudent to be prepared. Lieutenant, please proceed as you see fit. Aye, sir. Mr. Garrett, once we arrive, we'll need to conduct a full transpectral sensor sweep of the nebula. Do you anticipate any difficulties? Science systems are online and ready to go, but we're still configuring the linkages between the sensor array and the main computer. Is there a problem? Some of the bioneural circuits aren't processing the sensor inputs correctly. We're not sure why. Uh, <clears throat> we've been going through each bank of gel packs to see if we can isolate the cause, but so far everything checks out. Keep at it, Mr. Ronston. We need those sensors online as soon as possible. Yes, sir. If there's nothing further, then that'll be all. Dismissed. Dismissed, Doctor. if I join you? Doctor, may I sit down? Yes, of course, please. I wanted to check up on you. Commander Prentice was pretty rough on you earlier. Story of my life. We've been butting heads since the day we met. Is that why you requested a transfer? How do you know about that? Just a lucky guess. From the look on your face, I'm guessing the captain said no? Something tells me you don't need to guess. Why would he say no? I mean, it's obvious I don't fit in here. Is it? I see what you're doing, Doctor. You're about to give me the you have more friends here than you realize speech, right? I'd never be so presumptuous. But suppose I did. What would you say then? I'd say you're delusional. The first officer doesn't trust me to do my duty. He dressed me down like a junior cadet in front of the senior staff. No. No, this is the wrong place for me to be. Why can't the captain see that? I've known Gaius Rafe for a long time. If he wants you here, there's a reason. So what happens now? The captain denied your request for transfer, so what are you going to do next? The only thing I can do. Grin and bear it. Is that all? Doctor, whatever your point is, I wish you'd make it and get it over with. I'm sorry. I was only trying to help. But if that's how you respond when people try to be your friend, then maybe you're right. Maybe you don't belong here. Doctor, wait. Great. What else can go wrong today? to Captain Rafe. Rafe here. Go ahead, Lieutenant. Sir, we're receiving an urgent transmission from Starfleet Headquarters. It's Admiral Thorne. Put it through down here. Aye, sir. Admiral, I'm surprised to hear from you on a priority channel. What's going on? Change of plans, Gaius. A disaster. Some kind of subspace shockwave. It passed through the area several days ago, and badly damaged multiple inhabited planets. I feel like I'm stating the obvious. But shockwaves in space don't just appear out of nowhere. Something had to have caused it. Agreed. And rest assured, we will investigate the cause. But our first priority is to tend to the wounded. To that end, we'll rendezvous with a convoy of medical starships at Starbase 375, and escort them from there to the affected area. I have a question. Has Starfleet Command lost their minds, sending us to handle a crisis like this? Are you questioning our orders, Lieutenant? She does have a point. This is a challenge, but it's also an opportunity. An opportunity to prove we're equal to whatever challenges may arise. Starfleet officers have long been thrust into situations for which we were unprepared. In a sense, it's tradition. 
You notice he didn't answer the question. Mr. Garrett, I want you to assist Mr. Ronston with his efforts to solve our remaining systems problems. Every issue we can address en route is an issue we won't have to face once we arrive. Aye, sir. Doctor, you'll coordinate with the medical convoy to make preparations. You'll be in command of all medical operations once we arrive. Don't worry, I'll take care of everything. Starfleet is attempting to use the Argus Array to investigate the region where the shockwave originated, but subspace radiation levels in the vicinity remain dangerously high, and so far, readings have been inconclusive. We have no idea what's going on or what to expect, so an expert in subspace physics will accompany us to assist in determining a cause. And how to keep it from happening again. Hopefully. Indeed, Doctor. Commander, set a course for Starbase 375, maximum warp. Dismissed. I'm beginning to think they should have run this design across a few more drawing boards before they decided to actually build one. It seems like every diagnostic turns up a new problem. Considering the circumstances, we're doing the best we can. It's just going to take time, that's all. Right. Has Max finished replacing those faulty gel packs? About half an hour ago. Transpectral sensors are functioning normally now. One item down, 47 to go. Make that 48. Lieutenant, what can we do for you? I've been running tests on the shield generators. They're taking too long to power up. 48. Hmm. Ensign, will you call up the service logs for the defense systems? Got it. Replay from time index 339. The activation sequence is taking too long. By almost two full seconds. I'll add that to the list. Thanks for letting us know about this. That's it? Lieutenant? I've identified a major issue with the defense systems, and all you can say is thanks for letting us know? Don't you think this might be slightly more urgent than your average problem? Of course I do. But every primary system on this ship has problems, and I only have so many engineers to go Garrett to engineering. Mitchell here, go ahead. I finished realigning the structural integrity grid. Can you verify the system is stable? We're on it, Max. Stand by. Excuse me. Looks good, Max. Efficiency is increased by almost 17%. I'd say that's more than sufficient. Acknowledged. I'll finish up here and then see if I can fix that alignment fault in the transporter targeting scanners. Garrett out. Well? Lieutenant, I assure you, we'll get to it as soon as we possibly... Can you at least help me track down the source of the problem? I'll fix it myself if I have to. <sighs> of course. This shouldn't take but a second. Well, here's your problem. Power conduit is malfunctioning. Looks like a burned out anodyne relay. Where? Deck 11, section 29 alpha, bulkhead 011. Third tray from the left. Thank you. Lieutenant, wait. I'll come with you. Captain's Log, Stardate 58171.2 Thanks to redoubled efforts from Mr. Garrett and Mr. Ronston, we've managed to resolve nearly all remaining systems malfunctions. Meanwhile, the Fitzgerald is proceeding to Starbase 375, where, along with the Medical Task Force, we'll rendezvous with the Starship Teedman to receive our mission specialist. Approaching destination. Slow to impulse. We're secure from warp speed. Now approaching Starbase 375. We're coming into visual range. On screen. Such an impressive feat. Sir? It's something of a um, historical irony, Commander. During the war, this was one of Starfleet's primary staging areas. 
but today it's been repurposed as a medical support facility. All this for medical operations. Never forget the tolls of war, Lieutenant. Even five years later, many throughout the quadrant remain in need of assistance. This is one of many forward installations being utilized by Starfleet Medical for that purpose. I see. Captain the Teedman just entered transporter range. They're standing by to beam our specialist aboard. Understood. Commander, Lieutenant, you're with me. We'll be in transporter room three. Mr. Garrett, you have the bridge. Welcome on board the Fitzgerald Doctor. Permission to come aboard, Captain. Permission granted. Please. It's good to see you again, Gaius. Who are your friends? May I introduce my first officer, Commander Bradley Prentiss, and Chief of Security, Lieutenant Kendra Erickson. Dr. Brian Gar, Federation Science Directorate. Chief, please coordinate with the Teedman to have my personal effects beamed aboard, and I'll need quarters if you haven't set any aside. We've prepared guest accommodations on Deck 5, Section 22. If you'd like, I'll escort you there now. That won't be necessary. It's been a while since I was aboard a Galaxy-class starship, but I think I can find the way. They're all the same, anyway. Let me get this out of the way now. I'm sure you're all quite good at what you do. But we have a mystery. A mystery of a kind that Starfleet dislikes. And I'm here to solve it. I understand that no one likes visitors from headquarters because supposedly we don't understand how things work on a starship in the field. So let me make this absolutely clear right here, right now. I hold the same rank as Captain Rafe. He commands the ship and the overall mission, but as of now, I assume command of all science operations. I expect full cooperation from all personnel for the duration of this mission. Deck officer, please note that in the ship's log. There's no need for concern, Doctor. We'll make sure you have everything you need. I'm sure you will. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'd like to get some rest. Of course. And Doctor. Welcome aboard. Hmm. Pretentious, isn't he? I hadn't noticed. Fallwell here, go ahead. Doctor, what's your status? I've downloaded all the files on the Ruinor colony, and the last of the replicator patterns is coming through now. Do we have any more information on what kind of damage they've sustained? Unfortunately, no. We've been unable to re-establish contact since their initial distress call. I wish we knew what kinds of injuries to expect, and how many. Use your best judgment, Doctor. In the absence of certain knowledge, it's all we have. Aye, Captain. Is there anything else you require from the Starbase? Negative. I think we have everything we need. Then we'll depart at once. Rafe out. Helm set course for the Ruinor colony. Proceed at impulse until we clear the Starbase defense perimeter, then accelerate to warp speed. Aye, sir. Course laid in. Engage. We've cleared the defense perimeter. Warp drive standing by. Take us to the Ruinor colony, Ensign. Maximum warp. Aye, sir. Engaging warp engines.
Something I can help you with, Doctor. I need to speak with the Chief Engineer about a systems issue. I'll be happy to help you with anything you might- If it's all the same to you, Ensign. I'd rather speak with the Chief Engineer. Now, please. It's all right, Renee. What can we do for you, Doctor? I was running a diagnostic on the transpectral sensor array when I noticed that resolution was below 70%. I have never seen a deviation this severe, so understandably, I have questions. Well, we've been having problems with a number of primary systems. I had thought we had this problem fixed, but, but obviously you were mistaken. So it would seem. Attention on deck! I'm sure I needn't remind everyone that you are no longer on a leisurely shakedown cruise. This is an actual mission, and I for one intend to take it seriously. I suggest you all do the same. I understand you faced a number of challenges getting this ship ready for launch, and considering the circumstances you did an admirable job, but now you're in the real world, and in the real world you have jobs to do. You're Starfleet engineers, and that means at any moment, lives could depend on the work that you do. I suggest you up your game, because right now, I'm not sure I'd be willing to trust you with mine. That's all. As you were. Doctor, why don't you come with me? We'll see if we can't fix your problem. Lead the way. There is no cause for an adverse emotional response. The doctor's perspective is most logical. Somehow that just makes it worse. Lieutenant, what can I do for you? Are all these for the colony? We've replicated enough disaster relief kits for every ship in the convoy. We'll transport these down directly from the Fitzgerald once we achieve orbit. Will it be enough? I hope so. Doctor, we're still 47 hours from the colony. But I want you to start thinking about security arrangements for your away mission. Security arrangements? That's right, Doctor. Ruinor is a frontier colony, and this close to the edge of Federation space, anything can happen. I honestly don't think there's much to worry about. Ruinor is- Ruinor is a fringe colony inhabited by people who on an average day barely even acknowledge their Federation citizens. They're Maquis in all but name. I understand you have a duty as a medical officer to see to the wounded whoever they may be, but don't lose sight of your personal safety while you're doing it. I'll be careful. I'm glad to hear it, because I'm sending a security detachment with you. While you look after the patients, they'll look after you. Lieutenant. Thank you. Computer. T. Earl Grey. Ha. Huh. Come. Yes, Commander. Update from Starfleet. They've tried everything, but the Argus Array just can't penetrate the subspace radiation along the shockwave's trajectory. Looks like we're on our own. Unfortunate, but not unexpected. What's the status of Dr. Falwell's preparations? She's as ready as she can be. Trauma teams on the medical ships have been briefed on the worst-case scenario, and they're preparing triage facilities as we speak. I confess I am somewhat ambivalent about leaving Dr. Falwell behind while we investigate the shockwave. But... But she's made up her mind, and that's all there is to it. Indeed. Speaking of people that broker no argument once their minds are made up... Lieutenant Erickson has decided to send a security detail to the surface with her. An unfortunate necessity, but a necessity nonetheless. Given the particulars of the colony's history, even a humanitarian mission may stir old resentments. Agreed. People who weren't happy with the Federation or the Cardassians, but who didn't have the stomach to join the Maquis. In the end, that choice saved their lives. Hm. Tell me, do you drink tea, Commander? Uh, no, sir. I prefer coffee myself. You should give it a try one day. There are many varieties from which to choose. This particular blend didn't agree with me at first, and many that have tried it believed I might dislike it. But I decided to try it anyway, find out for myself. And what I discovered was that, while it certainly isn't going to become a favorite, 
With time, I could learn to tolerate it, perhaps even to appreciate it. But it only happened because I took a chance and ignored the opinions of others. I'll keep that in mind, sir. Dismissed. Computer, display all Starfleet records pertaining to the Roanor colony. Captain's Log, Supplemental. The Fitzgerald has arrived at the Ruinor Colony, where we begin the grim task of assessing the damage to this once hospitable system. We're secure from warp speed, now entering the Ruinor system. We're within visual range of the colony. Put it on screen. You won't like what you see. Magnify. scan. What's their status? The colony's been devastated. Minimal energy readings. Most of the settlement's infrastructure has been damaged or destroyed. Atmospheric readings highly inconsistent with previous survey. Carbon monoxide levels have risen near toxic, and atmospheric pressure has fallen almost 8 kilopascals below normal. Didn't this planet used to have rings? They appear to have been pulverized by the shockwave. The outer atmosphere is full of dust. Contamination at ground level is only about 10 parts per million, but that'll increase as the particulates descend. Survivors. Sensors show approximately 8,000 life signs on the planet's surface, but some of them are highly erratic. Looks like there are a lot of injured people down there. How many are Almost 2,000. Open hailing frequencies. Channel open. This is Captain Gaius Ray for the Federation Starship F. Scott Fitzgerald. We've brought personnel and supplies and are standing by to render assistance. Please respond. Ruin our colony, do you read? Lieutenant, confirm they're receiving. There's been so much damage to the settlement, there's no guarantee their comm systems are even functioning. We can try to reroute. They're responding. Audio only. Fitzgerald, this is Ruin our colony. Chief Administrator Judson speaking. Are we ever glad to see you? We'll reach orbit of your world in approximately four minutes. With your permission, we'll begin deploying personnel and supplies at once. Permission granted, Captain. We're sending transport coordinates. We have it, sir. Acknowledged, Administrator. We'll be there shortly. Fitzgerald out. Godspeed, Doctor. You're in command of the medical convoy and all relief efforts. The Fitzgerald will investigate the source of the shockwave, but our first priority is the safety of the colony. Alert us immediately if you require assistance. Understood. Good luck. To both of us. Chief Science Officer's Log, Stardate 58211.3 With relief operations well underway on the planet's surface, it's my turn to go to work. With ship systems finally in proper working order, I've been able to gather a few more pieces to this puzzle. It's not much to go on, but a great man once said, every trail starts somewhere. I've downloaded the sensor records from the colony, along with several other planets in the region that were also affected by the shockwave. Based on that, I've been able to triangulate a point of origin. As best I can tell, this is where it started a point about 2.6 light years from our present position. That looks like empty space. That's because it is. According to Federation star charts, there's nothing out there. Certainly nothing that could cause a disaster like we've seen. And yet, it happened. Doctor, what can you tell us about the shockwave itself? There wasn't much more than a directional bearing in the sensor logs I was able to recover. Looks like it kept going for about another light year after passing through this area before it finally dissipated. But based on the radiation it left in its wake, 
we're dealing with something that could easily have been much worse. So it sounds like our first step should be to investigate the source. We should try sending a probe. And what makes you think a probe is going to do us any good, Commander? It's the logical first step, Doctor. Regulations say that in the event of a severe natural disaster involving unknown and potentially potentially lethal phenomena, phenomena, conduct remote reconnaissance before attempting manned exploration. Regulation 227 Beta, Section 3, Paragraph 2, Line 4. I wrote it, Commander. Then you of all people should know, Doctor, that- Then I of all people should know that what Starfleet Command had in mind was situations completely different from this one. I'll thank you not to second-guess my judgment, Commander. May I remind you, I am in command of all science operations for the duration of this mission. I will decide which investigatory steps are appropriate and which are not. Is that clear? I said, is that clear, Commander? Yes, sir. Very clear. Good. One thing you'll learn out in the real world, Commander, is that regulations are written on paper, not carved in stone. They're there to safeguard the lives of people with too much curiosity and not enough common sense. Or enough experience. We don't send people out here to get themselves hurt. Once we got a directional bearing, I tried running long-range scans of the area. But our sensors can't penetrate the subspace radiation any more than the Argus Array could. All I got back was static. And as I was about to point out a few moments ago... The radiation from a subspace event like this can take weeks to dissipate. It tends to interfere with sensor scans. It can certainly disrupt telemetry from a probe. Then it would seem we have no alternative but to investigate ourselves. Ensign, once we're finished here, will you set a course to follow the directional bearing of the shockwave? Aye, sir. Dismissed. the commander down right in front of everybody. I believe it. I feel like I should talk to him. Why? He's not what you'd call chatty. He is one of the Federation's leading scientific minds. Probably doesn't have patience for social graces. (laughs) I'll say. You should have heard the reprimand he gave the engineering staff the other day. I thought Lieutenant Erickson was demanding, but she's nothing next to Dr. Gar. All the more reason to at least introduce myself. I know the ship better than he does, plus I'm an expert on the transpectral sensor array. Maybe if I can help solve problems, it'll keep everyone else out of the line of fire. Are you sure this isn't just some attempt at hero worship? Maybe it is. Can you blame me? Wouldn't you want to meet Geordie LaForge or Montgomery Scott if they were here? Fine, go ahead. Don't say I didn't warn you. Excuse me, Doctor. Yes, Ensign. Doctor, I'm Ensign Call, Junior Astrophysics Officer and... And Mission Flight Controller, yes, I'm aware. Is there something I can do for you, Ensign? I'm familiar with your work. And I'm familiar with the ship's science systems, including the transpectral sensors. If you need anything while you're on board, I'd be happy to assist you. I'll bear that in mind, Ensign. But I think I'm quite capable of doing things myself. Now, if you'll excuse me... I have work to do. Carry on. So how'd it go? Don't ask. Deck 14. Good afternoon, Doctor. Gaius? Deck 22. I'm pleased the Fitzgerald is able to assist in your investigation. Think nothing of it. 
I actually wanted the Endeavor, but turns out they're not equipped for this kind of mission. The Fitzgerald was simply the next logical choice. I see. I did notice that you took my suggestion to proceed at low warp until we know more about what we're dealing with. It seemed a sensible precaution, since exact conditions can't be ascertained. Have you made any progress, Doctor? I could recite you a long list of facts and theories, but your father would say there's no path but forward. The best thing we can do is keep our eyes open and proceed with caution. When I have more, you'll have more. Carry on, Captain. Yes. May I come in? Please. I thought you should know. We heard from Dr. Falwell about an hour ago. So far, they haven't run into any problems, but she said she felt better with the security detail you assigned. Well, that's good news. If there's nothing else, there is. It occurred to me that... Since we're heading into circumstances unknown, it wouldn't hurt to be prepared. As much as we can be, anyway. What do you mean? We still don't know what caused the shockwave we're chasing down. But we do know it's some kind of subspace phenomenon, and we do have an expert in those on board. Do you think you could work with Dr. Gar to develop some kind of protection? Against something totally unknown? Anything is better than nothing. I suppose it is. I'll consult with the doctor at his earliest convenience, and we may want to bring in the engineering staff as well. That sounds like a good idea. If there's anything else you need, please let me know. Aye, sir. Carry on, Lieutenant. Computer, display results of radiometric isometry analysis. Of course. Result inconclusive. Again. Computer, run a correlation between sensor records of the Ruinor shockwave and all known interspatial phenomena. Note any results with 70% similarity or better. Searching. Why can't I figure out what this is? Computer, stop playback. Which holodecks are available for use? Come. Yes, Lieutenant. What can I do for you? I've just had a very interesting conversation with Commander Prentice. He recommended I consult with Dr. Gar to do whatever he does. A logical step. If anyone can help us devise some means of protection, I'd wager Dr. Gar can. Yes, sir. Does that mean I have your approval? You are the chief of security aboard this ship. Any action you wish to take to that end hardly calls for the captain's consent. Yes, sir. It's just... Is there a problem, Lieutenant? <sighs> He's been somewhat irascible since the moment he came aboard. In your case, I'd even say there's some degree of animus. And you're wondering what precisely that animus entails? In so many words, sir. Sit down, Lieutenant. In point of fact, Brian Gar and I haven't spoken in more than a decade, not since we graduated from the Academy. It's a long time to hold a grudge. Indeed. Brian was always steeped in remembrances of the past. He likened them to companions that were always with him, but I rather saw them as specters that haunted him, made him fearful to embrace the present. I suppose you might call it an obsession. So what happened? After Wolf 359, Brian helped me come to terms with my father's death. We were like brothers. He refused to allow me to wallow in self-pity, and it was at his insistence that we both attended Starfleet Academy. The boyhood mentor you mentioned before. It was Gar, wasn't it? At least, until we graduated. When the time came, I chose a different path than did he. 
and he felt you owed it to him to follow in his footsteps. He never forgave me for that. We went our separate ways, and we haven't spoken since. Until now. And it seems the passage of time has only worsened his disposition. Everyone responds to loss in their own way, Lieutenant. Some grieve, some become angry, some simply lose their way. But not everyone is fortunate enough to have support to work through it. I understand, sir. With your permission, I'll get started. Captain Rafe to the bridge, please. We're on our way. Yellow alert. Senior officers report to the bridge. Gaius, what's going on? We're coming up on the designated coordinates, Doctor. You'd better get up here. Right. We are secure from warp speed. Now entering sector 1138. Proceed at one quarter impulse. Gaius? Take your station, Doctor. Begin a full sensor sweep. I want to know what's out there. Shields are at maximum. Subspace radiation levels are extremely high, but we'll be all right as long as it doesn't get any worse. Doctor? That was a temporal distortion. Space time in the vicinity is highly unstable. It looks like the effect has already begun to dissipate, but. I doubt we've seen the worst of it. Any sign of what started all this? Sensors are picking up what could be a ship, bearing 251 Mark 47, adjusting course to intercept. Another temporal distortion. Intensity is increasing the closer we get to the target coordinates. Doctor report. Radiation is making it hard to get a clear reading on whatever it is, but its coordinates place it in the exact center of the shockwave's effect radius. Cause or effect? Indeed. We're within visual range. On screen. Magnify. Temporal distortions are centered at this location. I'd say this is definitely the focal point. What 
is it? It's definitely a starship, but energy readings are negligible. Whatever it is, it looks like it's unpowered. Whatever it is, its hull shows definite signs of exposure to a massive chronometric discharge. Question isn't where it came from, but when. Lieutenant, life signs. I still can't get clear biometric readings. Radiation is continuing to interfere with our scans. Commander. I want you to take an away team over there. Find out what you can and report back. And if we encounter something unexpected? Exercise extreme caution. We'll maintain constant transporter locks and at the first sign of trouble we'll beam you back. Aye, sir. Kendra, Max, you're with me. Mr. Ronston, meet us in transporter room four. I'm coming too. Doctor, I think it would be better if you stayed here until we know it's safe. While you and three other members of the senior staff traipse through unknown territory with unknown dangers. Common sense says whatever's going on, that ship is part of it. I'm going. Clear. Radiation levels are within acceptable tolerances. Life support is still functional, but at minimal levels. Atmospheric pressure is normal, but oxygen levels have fallen below 80% of normal. We'll only be here for a little while. Just long enough to get an idea what happened. Speak for yourself, Commander. Conduit interface isn't responding. Looks like the entire computer network is offline. I'm getting some odd readings from these bulkheads. The alloys are a match for a Federation starship, but there's a variation in the molecular structure that I can't account for. I'll have to analyze these readings more closely when we get back to the Fitzgerald. All right, here's the plan. Dr. Gar and I will go to the bridge and try to download the ship's sensor logs from there. Merv, you and Kendra have a look at the rest of the ship, see what kind of shape the primary systems are in. Keep an open comm link and stay alert. This may look like familiar territory, but the resemblance is only skin deep. There's no telling what you might run into. Well said, Commander. Let's go, Doctor. Well, Turbolifts are online, at least. Thank heaven for small favors. After you. Status of away team transporter lock. Lock holding steady. I think. I beg your pardon, Ensign? I... Yes, sir. Lock's holding steady. I'm having to make continuous adjustments to compensate for the radiation around the ships, but we haven't lost track of the away team yet. Keep a close eye on them, Ensign. If the lock wavers even slightly, have the transporter room beam them back at once. Aye, sir. Clear. Hmm, this doesn't look good. There's no power to any of the bridge systems. And Deck 1 is running on emergency life support. Command pathways are intact, but I'm not getting any response from the main computer. Looks like Merv was right. The entire ODN network is offline, even the backup relays. What could cause a shipwide system failure like this? I don't know, and I'm not sure I want to find out. Gah, useless. What are you doing? Well, we're not going to get anything from the main computer until we get emergency power back online. 
but I may have another way to figure out what happened here. If I can access the command buffers for the bridge stations, I might be able to reconstruct at least a few hours based on that data. Now why didn't I think of that? It's like I told you before, Commander. Be aware of what's happening around you and adapt. The thought occurred to me as soon as we came in here and saw what a shambles the bridge was in. And I don't even serve on a starship. <sighs> Maybe you're right. Maybe I miss three quarters of what's going on around me. But would it kill you to show some tact once in a while? I fail to see the relevance, Commander. From the moment you beamed aboard the Fitzgerald, you've been impatient and demanding with everyone. I've heard that some of the junior officers are actually afraid to try to talk to you. This is hardly the time or place to have this conversation, Commander. I disagree, Doctor. What is it, I wonder, that makes you think it's acceptable to treat your fellow officers that way? I have no interest in making friends, Commander. I've told you that once already. You're evading the question. I understand your tactical officer has some rather frank opinions about you in that regard. Demanded a transfer off the ship only a few days ago, which she attributed to you. How do you know about that? There's very little I don't know about the Starship Fitzgerald, Commander. And I can't help but appreciate the irony of someone who evoked that kind of reaction from someone under his command, lecturing me about being hard to get along with. Much as it pains me to admit it, Doctor, maybe you're right. I usually am. But the difference between you and me is that I've made a concerted effort to do better. Are you sure about that? When this mission is over, what makes you think she won't make the same request all over again? Maybe this time, Gaius will actually take pity on her and say yes. You make a valid point. She could do that. Which is why I've tried as hard as I can to show that I've realized my mistake and that I'm doing everything I can to correct it. If she still chooses to leave, then at least I know I did everything I could to prevent it. Is that so? Do you really think it's possible to just wash away all those hard feelings, all those mistakes, and start fresh like nothing had ever happened? I honestly don't know, but I'd like to think so. If you're sincere about it, I'd like to think there's no mistake that can't be mended. No mistake. You're sure about that. What I'm sure of is that it's no coincidence you ended up on the Fitzgerald for this little outing. I think you knew full well what you were doing, and I think it has something to do with your history with the captain. A very interesting theory, Commander. A very interesting theory, indeed. You're getting ahead of me again. What? Oh, sorry. It's all right. Without the structural integrity grid, the hull is going to be subject to occasional gravitic stress. It's nothing to worry about. You're sure? A absolutely. Right. Just remember... Stay behind me if you expect me to protect you. Now what? You're taking this awfully seriously. What possible threat could there be on a deserted starship with no power? I'm not sure. All I know is this place gives me the creeps. I feel like we're being watched. You're just being paranoid. Maybe. But until I know for sure, I'm going to stay on my guard. And you should too, if you... What is it? I'm picking up a faint energy signature. That way. That's toward the cargo bays. Come on. And stay behind me. I've got it. You've got what? The secondary command buffers are still online. Looks like there's enough stored data to reconstruct at least the last few minutes before the main systems failed. A few minutes. That's it. Looks like that's it. Anything before that would be in the main computer. Which is still offline. That's not a lot to go on, but it's better than nothing. Agreed. 
It might be enough to tell us if this ship is the cause of our problems or just one more symptom. Download in progress. Now there's nothing to do but wait. Ronston to Prentice. Prentice here, go ahead. Commander, we found something in Cargo Bay 2. Looks like a stasis chamber. Is it occupied? You could say that. That's how it happened. When the Borg cube self-destructed, I got caught in the explosion. Thankfully, the ship's hull was able to withstand the impact, but the energy surge penetrated every deck, every system. And since the only component aboard that could channel that much energy was the time device, here I am. A compelling account. And it likely explains the shockwave. Shockwave? Why here? Why now? Who knows? For all I know, this is where Dracus was planning to go next. Or it could be random, there's no way to know. Dracus? Sounds like something out of a children's story. Doctor, your analysis. I'm getting some strange readings from his DNA. His cell membranes are giving off residual traces of some kind of exotic energy. It's unlike anything I've ever seen before, but getting caught in the explosion of a Borg ship and hurled through time by an unstable chroniton field could certainly explain what I'm seeing. That's not all. Every strand of his DNA shows signs of severe fragmentation. Every nucleotide sequence, every protein, all of it. It's like it's been torn apart and then reassembled by a self-styled Picasso, one with even less talent than the original. Is he in any immediate danger? I don't believe so. The patient seems healthy enough, at least for the moment. But without a greater understanding of what caused this damage, I can only speculate as to the long-term ramifications. Continue with your analysis, Doctor. Keep me advised of your progress. Aye, Captain. In the meantime, it would seem that you've endured quite the ordeal. I suggest that you should get some rest. I'd like to hear more about your experience once you feel up to it. We can talk now if you want. I feel perfectly fine. You're not going anywhere. You're extremely dehydrated to say nothing of malnourished. You're staying right here for at least the next 24 hours while I treat you. Sedated, if necessary. I can't tell you how excited that makes me. Very good. Then the matter is settled. If you'll excuse me. Brian. Gaius, I know what you're asking. And I wish I had an answer. If you have reservations, that's hardly something I take lightly. Tell me. Something about this doesn't feel right. His explanation is certainly plausible, but I'm not sure I buy it. For what reason? By his own admission, there were two other versions of of me mixed up in all this, which logically begs the question, how do we know he is who he says he is? Just an innocent bystander that wound up here through no fault of his own. Is there a way to make certain of his identity? We could analyze his quantum signature, but all that would tell us is what we already know, that he's from another timeline. We'd have to know which quantum signature goes with what timeline for that to do us any good. Recommendations. (sighs) Keep your eyes open. Something tells me there's more going on here than meets the eye, and until we know what it is, we can't afford to take any chances. Recommendation noted. Perhaps if you spoke with him, you better than anyone would be able to determine if what he says were true. Why does everyone always think that? Yes, we certainly look alike, but that's as far as it goes. His experiences and mine are completely different, meaning we are two completely different people. Who's to say I know any more about how he thinks than 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 you do how I think? Your point is well made, Doctor. Nevertheless, your expertise may be critical to understanding what's happened. I must still recommend you speak with him. Fine. But I want to find some answers myself first. In the meantime, you keep your eyes open. I'll be in engineering.
This looks like a complete mess. I thought you said the command buffers were intact. I did, and they were. But it looks like they took damage just like everything else over there. This kind of data fragmentation is exactly what I'd expect from an energy search through the computer system. So what's the prognosis, Doctor? Well, data recovery is more art than science, but we should have something in the next few hours or so. Hours? Usually takes days just to get started. Well, I wrote this data recovery program myself, and I don't much care how long things are supposed to take. Naturally. If there's something on your mind, Commander, let's have it. I was curious, Doctor. What was your impression of that ship out there? It was eerie. From its outward appearance, I was expecting sharp edges, harsh lighting, something more menacing than what we did find. In a way, everything looking so normal was even more unsettling than the alternative. Maybe a better question would be what your impression was. To tell you the truth, I'm not sure. From an engineering standpoint, it's a marvel of technology. Everything on board is years, if not decades, ahead of anything we've got. But then you look at the tactical systems. There are things here that I've never seen before. Some of it almost looks Borg. Now there's a cheerful thought. And the hull. It's layered with some kind of quantum crystalline armor. It looks almost like a derivative of neutronium, but I didn't think it was possible to stack multiple atomic layers this close together. I thought this kind of thing was only theoretical. The Starfleet has been experimenting along these lines, but we're a long way from being able to construct a ship's hull out of it. Well, it looks like someone beat you to it. If I had to guess, I'd say this ship could fly right through a star and come out the other side without getting so much as singed. Probably wouldn't even need radiation shielding. I have eyes, Commander, and I can see all this for myself. What's your point? I just... I don't like it. It may look like a Starfleet vessel, but if I didn't know better, I'd swear I was looking at a miniature Borg ship, augmented with technology that the laws of physics say shouldn't even exist. Commander, I suggest we save the theoretical debate for later. Right now, we have a mystery to solve. Excuse me, Doctor. Yes, Ensign. Doctor, I've just finished recalibrating the transpectral sensor array. You have. I wasn't aware anyone had asked you to do that, Ensign. No, sir, but I thought it might help with your investigation. In other words, you were taking initiative. Yes, sir. And what was the result of your initiative, Ensign? Quantum resolution has increased by 14%. Is that so? And just how did you manage that? It's all in my report, sir. This should help with our analysis of space-time in this region. Ensign, inform operations that I want a fresh set of transpectral sensor scans of the area. Then I want a comparative analysis with the data we collected when we first arrived. Aye, sir. And Ensign. Nice job. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. That'll be all. Bridge to Captain Rafe. Go ahead, Mr. Garrett. Sir, there's an incoming transmission for you from the Ruinor Colony. It's Dr. Falwell. Put it through. Aye, sir. Elizabeth. Hello, guys. It's good to hear from you. Are you... <clears throat> is everything all right? Everything is fine. Report. What's your status? Relief operations are proceeding smoothly. We've treated the worst of the injuries, and now we've moved on to general triage. What was the final tally? 683 dead, and almost 4,000 wounded. 
nearly a thousand critically. And the colony? Our initial findings were correct. A lot of the infrastructure has been completely destroyed. We're using portable generators from the medical ships to provide power, but... Perhaps the Starfleet Corps of Engineers can assist with the rebuilding. I'm afraid not. That's actually what I was calling about. What's happened? It looks like Dr. Gar was right. The dust from the planet's rings has begun to settle into the atmosphere. Particle contamination levels have been rising steadily since you left orbit. How bad is it? Bad enough that we've already had multiple cases of pneumoconiosis among otherwise healthy individuals. We've isolated the medical facilities on the surface to their own life support systems, but it's only a stopgap. We have to get everyone off this planet. How long do you estimate we have? Elizabeth? Our best estimates place survivability at a matter of weeks. So far, it's only happening to a few of us, but it's only a matter of time before we're all affected. Eventually, the atmosphere will be completely unbreathable. Understood. I'll inform Starfleet Command. There are several colony ships under construction at Utopia Planitia. Perhaps one of them might have sufficient capacity to evacuate the planet. Let's hope you're right. Do you have any idea what's behind all this? Our investigation is ongoing. We've developed several theories, but as yet we have nothing concrete. We hope to know more very shortly. Well, whatever did this, it's left a lot of suffering in its wake. Tell me you'll find an answer to all this, Gaius. Promise me. Count on it. Information retrieved from the Mark II's computers has at least partially corroborated my counterpart's story. Navigational logs confirm that the ship was in Sector 001 the day of the first Borg invasion in 2367. You still don't sound convinced. You should never, never doubt what nobody is sure about, Lieutenant. In any case, I also recovered visual records that confirm it was in close proximity to the Borg ship for an extended period, among other things. Let's see it. I thought you'd never ask. I did the best I could, but there wasn't a lot to work with. Understood. Proceed. So we were there, or at least some future version of us. Have you been able to verify any other parts of his story? Not yet. We sent probes to both the Beta Reticuli system and to Beta Stromgren, but there's no sign of an underground laboratory or what he described as a starship replicator in either location. Hard to imagine anything that could replicate a whole starship. I'd give a lot for a look at it if it was real. Oh, it's real. That oddity in the molecular structure that I noticed aboard the Mark II is consistent with matter replication, but on a scale far beyond anything I've ever seen. In any case, between information from the computer and listening to my counterpart's story, I've been able to reconstruct the sequence of events that led up to where and when we are, and there's a lot more to it than we thought. It all started here, when another of my counterparts opened Pandora's box and began experimenting with time travel. And, as tends to happen when you start messing around with time, something went wrong, and instead of being sent back a few years like he'd planned, he was thrown back decades, giving us the first alternate timeline. The radiation almost killed him, and he spent years recuperating. Then some kind of accident in Sector 585 caused that entire timeline to collapse in on itself, altering history again. Then that timeline continued until late 2399, which is when things get complicated. You mean they weren't complicated already? I'll ignore that. According to my counterpart, there was some kind of temporal disaster that annihilated space-time in 2399, leading our future selves to come back in time to repair the damage. That led them here, back to 2378. Then, for reasons which aren't entirely clear, they went back even further, and ended up in 2367 on the eve of the first Borg invasion of Earth, right after Wolf 359. Then they returned to their present, and for all we know, they lived happily ever after. Whatever happened, it's likely that in preventing the temporal disaster, they created yet another alternate timeline. 
That can't be right. Can it? Is one of those timelines ours? History's been altered so many times, there's no way to be sure. For all I know, this could be just one branching history among dozens. Or this could be the timeline that was supposed to happen if it hadn't been for all this. I hate temporal mechanics. Forgive me, Doctor, but you neglected to answer the question. Do you have some theory, any theory, about where and when we are in relation to all that? <sighs> the likeliest explanation, based on what we know, is that we are here. But as to whether this now is the correct one or not, I can't say. I'm not certain any of us could make that determination. The flow of time itself hangs in the balance. Even Asimov wouldn't touch this one. What's the responsible thing to do here? Keep it from happening again for a start. Well, whatever our course of action, we need more information about what's happened to make an ethical choice. Maybe our guest could shed some light on things. Doctor, how is the patient? Please activate monitor input 47, your emergency medical holographic channel. Of course. Thank you. You know, Captain, if it's your intention that I contribute, you really should include me from the start. I'll take that under advisement, Doctor. Report. The patient is recovering nicely. At the moment, he's resting comfortably. But he's expressed a desire to assist with the investigation. He says he's anxious to uncover what happened and begin looking for a way back to where he belongs. Have you made any progress with the analysis of his DNA? Not so far. Every test I run yields the same result. Massive DNA fragmentation with badly misaligned base pair sequences as far as the microscopic eye can see. I'm no closer to understanding the phenomenon or how to reverse it. Have you discovered anything of note? Anything anomalous? There are traces of synthetic materials in his blood and several major organs that I haven't been able to account for. Perhaps a submolecular scan might reveal something. Make it so, Doctor. In the meantime, Merv, I want you to take an engineering detail back to the Mark II and attempt to get the main computer online. If there is an answer to all this, it's likely to be found there. Aye, sir. That'll be all. Captain's Log Supplemental. Mr. Ronston and a team of engineers have begun the task of restoring power to the derelict vessel we've come to know as the Mark II. While Dr. Gar continues to direct our efforts to analyze space-time in the affected region, his counterpart remains under the care of the emergency medical hologram. Having spoken with him at some length, I'm uncertain if I'm struck more by the differences between he and my old friend, or the similarities. With the increased resolution of the transpectral sensor array, we've been able to make a more detailed analysis of space-time in the region. I'm not sure what it means, but take a look at this. What am I looking at? It's the precise frequency of the radiation signature left by the shockwave. Conventional scans couldn't isolate it, but Ensign Call's modifications did the trick. I've never seen anything like it. I have. It's residue of a substance called boronite. Boronite. It's a rare transperiodic element, exponentially more powerful than dilithium, but also proportionally unstable. Then what were they doing with it? Using it as a power source. No wonder space-time was torn apart the way it was. I don't understand, sir. That's because you don't know what boronite can be used to synthesize. This whole thing is starting to make sense. Sir? This is the emergency holographic doctor speaking. Dr. Gar, please respond. Gar here, go ahead. My patient is awake and requesting to speak with you. Please report to sickbay at once. I'm on my way, doctor. Carry on, Mr. Garrett. Engineering to bridge. Go ahead, Ensign. We've corrected the alignment fault in the optronic integrators on deck five. I think we're ready to try restarting the warp core third time's the charm. Let's give this another try. Prime the injector ports. Injector ports primed. Align the dilithium matrix and stand by to open injectors. Dilithium matrix is aligned. Injectors ready. Here we go. Ensign Mitchell, initialize injectors. Aye, sir. Initializing. We 
have to be missing something. But I don't see what it could be. We've turned the power grid inside out three times now, and each time we've come up empty. When you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. Logic dictates that if there is no fault within the power systems, then the source of the problem must lie elsewhere. As always, your logic is impeccable, but that doesn't exactly narrow the list of possibilities, does it? Where do we start? I recommend we begin with critical systems adjacent to the power grid. The control relays, for example. That's as good a place as any. <sighs> We're gonna need more hands for this. There are almost a hundred relay junctions in the primary hull alone. Ronston to damage control teams Delta and Gamma. Report to the Mark II on the double. We've got work to do. Aye, sir. You wanted to see me, Doctor. Thank you for coming so quickly. What's the status of your patient? And people complain about my bedside manner. Most of his vital signs have shown significant improvement over the last 12 hours. Except for one. There's a slight neurochemical imbalance in his hippocampus. There certainly is. I first noticed it when we examined him earlier. I thought it might be an after effect of his trip through time and it might eventually stabilize on its own. Except it hasn't. If anything, it's gotten worse. Any idea what's causing it? Not yet. But this could explain his emotional instability. It's not life-threatening, but I'm concerned it might indicate a larger problem. You don't sound certain. <sighs> That's because your counterpart is as stubborn as you are, and he's refusing to let me examine him any further. I was hoping you might be able to talk some sense into him. <laughs> what makes you think he'd listen to me? Simple. If you can't convince yourself, then who can? Besides, I don't have any better ideas. I was beginning to think you'd forgotten I was here. I'm the chief science officer aboard this ship, and we are in the middle of a major investigation. I can't just lie around and watch while others work, much as I'm sure you'd like to. The EMH tells me you're refusing to let it continue to treat you. Huh. As if you can't empathize. Fair enough. I didn't really want to talk about the EMH anyway. Then what? We've sent an engineering team over to your ship, and they're working to restore power. So I have a little time. Why don't we talk about the past? <laughs> 